<laughs> I got to get the fuck out of here. That's what I got to do. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, wow. Kyle, your show, baby. Oh, all right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Murder Hobo Inc. Between the Rolls, the talk show on Tuesdays, where we talk about last games, we're talking about future games, and we're going to talk about something completely random. <laughs> land. Glorious, glorious. Huge tracks Huge of tracks land. Huge of land. But before Man, we get ain't nothing if that, you don't got a ground. <laughs> <laughs> before we get any further than this, guys, if you're watching on Twitch, go ahead and hit the follow button. You can also uh, find our archive over at YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter um, if you want to talk to us about some stuff. Uh, maybe come up with some interesting tinfoil hat theories. We are the <laughs> QAnon of Discord. That's M Hobo <laughs> Discord. If you want to buy some of our cool, awesome crap, uh, that we have a store link right over there. Uh, and of course, if you don't like looking at any of our faces, the glare from the shiny, sweaty, bald, white bald heads of mess. ours. <laughs> hey, this is, a, this is a this is a quality rug it is. <laughs> it even extends like down here they're like Stop. 50 cents for that thing you know <laughs> so it came out of the sewer <laughs> over at tiny url.com slash mhobo inc audio <coughs> and finally thanks to our sponsors first one pirate dog dice for when you're rolling like shit get some pirate dog dice and their pirate dog dice shit die are some of the best rollers I've ever had. Uh, maybe it's because they have 20 on all the sides. Maybe it's because they're made of quality Chihuahuan dog shit. I'll never tell. Wow. Wow. And finally, we got to thank uh, Oddfish Games with their adventure sense. You know, uh, you break open that dog turd die and it stinks. Get something nice smelling in there. Bars, libraries, putrid hmm. sewers, the good stuff. And finally, the Shine Project. If you're looking at something to write and you're uh, starting to hit that wall there, you're not sure where to go from there, pick up the Shine Project. It's a nice little thing that'll ask the important questions and really add some depth to depth, 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 depth. <sighs> For someone who runs a Cthulhu game, I really have to, I should be able to say depth quite well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> we're a classy bunch here. Classy. Remember, this is for mature audiences only. Anyway, <clears throat> The Shine Project, it's a great book. I love it. When I started writing some random ideas for the campaign, uh, after having read the entire campaign novel, uh, I went to that and I got some interesting answers to what horrible things I could do to my players next. And that's that. Uh, obviously, I'm Kyle. I didn't introduce myself. I don't need an introduction because I'm amazing. Who needs an introduction? Frank. Frank, introduce yourself. Who the hell are you? Seriously, Frank's get off tired. My show. I am the owner operator of Adventures in Philbar, maker of, I don't know, there's a lot of shit out there. Tinyurl.com, Adventure <laughs> in Philbar. Uh, a lot of free stuff. Check out the free stuff first. That way you know if you want to spend the money. Uh, and if you like what you see, yeah, spend the money. Or not. It doesn't matter. I don't care. Uh, I'm trying to be zero sum about it. Normal DM, uh, creator of the greatest single campaign ever, Calamity, on Saturday night. Oh, it's not the previous campaign that's ended already? Sonella sucked ass. Let's face it. That thing was just a balls out disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't know. Show. I think Carol's uh, character had a hopping good time at the end. There. I just wish I'm I would sure have decapitated her and used her as a human torch. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Strange. Next, following up. Speaking of a calamity, there's none other more calamitous than Rob. Rob, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Calamity. Uh, I play Dave on Calamity, actually, and uh, show up on one shots every chance I get, pretty much. Um, I don't know. I'm making stuff. I made a meme. Go look at it. It's on Twitter. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty it's much about it. The Suez Canal, and <laughs> no, it's no, the no, last it's one. <laughs> it was his ass hair was braided. Man, that, that, was, that could be. It was hard to get all those braids in there. Oh gosh. <laughs> And speaking of Dave and calamities, (laughs) 
David, why don't you tell us about yourself? Hi, I'm David, not the barbarian. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I can uh, be Dave, Dave, what? What? Dave, what? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can be found most Tuesdays here on Between the Rolls. Uh I play Thursday nights on Cacophony and every other Saturday. I'm part of the greatest campaign ever, Calamity Campaign. It is, you know it. And uh yeah, every once in a while I can be caught on one shot here. So uh yeah, that's me. I think we're here to talk some do some recaps and talk some business. Huh? Guys, I know what you're doing. Something Clearly, like uh you're doing the Steinway advertising here. It's not a piano unless it's a Steinway, but uh mm-hmm. you guys suck, you're awful. Yeah, uh, we are. <laughs> the call of Cthulhu, Cthulhu rises, everyone dies, is clearly the Bosendorfer, the classier of the two campaigns. So much better. But we're not just, talking just about... Just because you have twice as many viewers doesn't make it that much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just because they're pre-gaming for Critical Role. <laughs> and they just need to ramp up to that you know Critical Role goodness. They get that nice mm, horror Cthulhu themes. Right. <laughs> but let's talk about something that's not a campaign. Let's talk about a soap opera. Last nice. Thursday, we had episode 223, The Tower of the Curd, uh, which was uh, Cacophony. Cacophony. Mm-hmm. Cacophony. David, what happened in Cacophony? Cacophony. Uh, well, we, we finished up The Tower of the Curd. Uh, yes, as the episode opens with our two feeble-minded characters, Zadar <laughs> and Daphne. <laughs> the scene culminates in uh, Camille taking some damage from the same thing and Tigris getting beamed in the noggin too with this and rendered feeble-minded for a period of time also. So... Yeah, from Zadar wandering around, wandering into the wardrobe, almost kicking the object around. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Camille finally manages to get the object inside the steel case. And um, yeah, so we take the football and exit the tower. <laughs> so uh, there we met with uh, the other tribes of uh, Telosia. Uh Sirens uh, can be heard. Uh, troops mar- mar- marching forward. Uh, but one of the things that we notice is that the the mesa is suddenly turning into a verdant oasis. Oasis. There we go. Don't add an H. Uh, so a verdant uh, oasis. Oasis. Yeah, the sewer lines much. blew <laughs> up. It just filled up. It was some nasty crap coming underneath the mesa. I it was. Familiar. Yes. Yeah. And you <laughs> ask GMs, you know, where their ideas come from, and they just say everyday life. True life, baby. It is true. It is true. Go ahead. So anyway, uh, as we exit the tower, we are greeted by all the tribes of Telosia with their representatives all up in arms because the tower has been cleared and the rightful ruler wants to take their place upon the throne of the Kurd. Problem is, there are several people that are vying for it. So, But as far as the tower is concerned, your intrepid crew have unlocked the secret uh, history of what happened with the calamity and what caused it. And to much of the other tribal le- leaders chagrin they really did not like the truth <laughs> so uh we managed to have a con- uh, uh arranged to have a conference we decided to sleep on it meet in the morning but two of the the leaders have absconded what? during the <clears throat> night and proceeded to enter the tower so after discovering this we all fall- filed into the tower the tower and uh, lo and behold, Hempta, the seductive, and I forgot who else tried to sit on the throne. Elsa, I think. <laughs> yeah. El- Ezra? Ezra? Ez- something like that. Uh, I don't so, know. I, I don't know. I only half ass pay attention to it. Yeah, you only wrote it. So. <laughs> Steve. Steve. <laughs> yeah, Steve, the leader Steve. of Telosia. 
Yeah, there Steve the Talosian. We're found unconscious on the floor because they tried to sit on the throne and they are not the rightful heirs. So anyway, scene culminates with, uh, you know, a rebuttal about and dissertation about who should sit on the throne. Meanwhile, Tigress and her father have undergone, let's say, a transmogrification. They are no longer Weemix. They are very attractive humanoids now, especially Tigress. So... Uh, with the theory in mind, Tigress whispers to Sadar, do you still have the crown? What Sadar did, he pocketed it. <laughs> People were still looking for the crown. He gives the crown to Tigress, who takes a risk, sits upon the throne, and places the crown on her head. Lo and behold, you have the, the new... Oh, ah, the new curd. Anyway... So that's how it, it culminated. Uh, let's see. Also, some other visitors from Cacophony make an appearance in a wonderful airship. And uh, yeah. Mortimer J. Sneed? No, it's not. Oh, it's Aerosmith. <laughs> oh. So uh, yeah. So the intrepid trio. Uh, yeah, set don't sail. Forget, don't forget who you fucked over the Telosians with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, our favorite little halfling thief. Yeah. Skippy Lee. Yeah. Ends up becoming the court jester for, for Tigress. So, good luck that, with that. That can't <laughs> go wrong. That can't go wrong at all. <laughs> Define and, wrong again. <laughs> What's so about it, to happen? <laughs> so it ends. It ends with them uh, sailing away with the football, bringing it to the wisest man in all of the world, Mortimer J. Steed, at the Grand Academy. We are on our way. So, yes, and but <laughs> but on our journey, we run into. Let's say a castle in the clouds, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Nothing bad could happen there. And that is the cacophony uh, episode. Is it time for the giants, gi giants disco episode. Oh. It it's time be. for a giant something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm your giant man. That's what I am. I'm here to. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. There we go. <laughs> it was good. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of that, wow. Rob, oh, wow. Saturday, <laughs> Cloaca in Cathaway. You see, sewers are going to come up again. There we go. <laughs> All it's the a, time. It's that whole Cloaca thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a lovely little party. Ian joined us. Uh, Ian was from Hoosier Con, I think, is where yes. he yep. met up with the hobos. Now he's been sucked in for a second time. We'll get him back. Uh, he played a human ranger uh, named Fluzum Clunt from Clunt and Sons Gong Farming and Night Soil Services. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. It's a pretty well developed character for like a one shot. That. that was a well developed <laughs> character. Uh, he had slogans. He had a whole life plan planned. It was great. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and he played it well. Uh, and he's looking toward being a swarm keeper. So, you know, I've got res mad respect for that. Um, <clears throat> Carol played Jory, a wood elf rain, uh, rogue, although mm -hmm. her plaques had half elf. She insisted she was a full wood elf. We'll see. <laughs> I probably insisted fucked that she up. Was full <laughs> wood elf. Uh, and uh, David had a human sorcerer. Mm -hmm. A human sorcerer. Willard. And Willard had a rat filler named Ben and. Willard, Willard worked for the sewage and water treatment board. So, <laughs> no, I shouldn't have told him what it was about. Oh, it was a lot of fun anyway. Oh my god, you had a blast, Frank. You liked it. <laughs> uh, and I played a a tiefling warlock just to show Carol that tieflings and warlocks can use fire spells. Um, <laughs> but uh, go fiend warlock, you get fire spells. What do you want? Mm -hmm. um, and had just a crappy stat left for throwing into strength, so I gave him a strength of seven and <coughs> used that as my dump stat and made him very small to account for that five foot two and 101 pounds. 
Don't uh, forget the also he's a very prissy, prissy dresser, all yeah. in black and crimson clothing, uh, some dark gothy silver rings, and his Eldritch Blast is a spiraling rainbow cone. And his Eldritch Blast is pew. Eventually it will be pew pew. So he's a tiefling warlock is what I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. <laughs> he's exactly a tiefling warlock. Should have been called Cluster Every bit of it. Cathaway. <laughs> <laughs> it was an awesome adventure in the sewers of Cathaway. Uh, we were uh, tasked to recover a missing ferret, which we did not accomplish in any way, shape, or form. Oh. Um, but we traveled into the sewers, ran into <clears> some mud <throat> methods uh that proved to be a little harder than I thought they were gonna be to kill but, <laughs> uh, something to do about rolling low numbers on the part of a human ranger anyway he made up for it later yeah. um I wept off of burning hands and cooked on a couple of them uh he actually did all right the first round against them and then after that kind of flailed uh, <laughs> I just kind of rewatched it so not long ago so um yeah, pumping we, the numbers, baby. <laughs> yeah, they were bad. Uh, after that, we ran on down the way, and there was a clog in the drain, which uh, had a bracelet stuck in it, and I made him break up the clog by making it moan. Um, and uh, yeah, you heard that right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll leave it. Uh, pretty much. After that, we. Uh, continued on looking for the ferret and Ben got sent ahead to look for the ferret and then Ben was in trouble so we all rushed off to save Ben because none of us realized it was a familiar we thought it was his beloved pet oh, well I mean well he is anyway. but yeah uh, there was a vine blight which we had to deal with uh, that took uh, again a lot more <laughs> work than <laughs> one would think largely due to the positioning of having two meat shields in front of the people that could actually damage it without being hurt. Um, <laughs> Spacing is important. Yeah, well, we shot around them. Uh, so that was pretty good. We got damaged hard by that. We went on looking after that, and uh, they were trying to decide whether or not we were going to take a long rest, and I hadn't been wounded, so I trotted on down the tunnel further to look and see if I could find where the ferret was and ran into the BBG. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you know, split the party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's on the bingo card. I mean, <laughs> got to do it at some point. Uh, I found some kind of scorpion thing, not quite a carrion crawler, but a little bigger than a giant centipede. And, uh, it was bad. It hurt me. And I ran away, but I ran away screaming, so they all came after me. While I dodged out of range, and then one Almost of them fell. Almost TPK'd and I, these guys. <laughs> I had to Same stop class. and shoot back at it when he fell. Come on, I, <laughs> I actually, I was what nobody knew was I was flipping a coin continuously because Baz's alignment is chaotic as fuck. So whenever there's a decision point, Baz flips a coin. <laughs> wow nice he, he might have abandoned the party at any moment <laughs> but he came back we dealt with this uh, scorpion centipede thing and uh, decided for some reason to continue on because we found a backpack that contained potions oh that was it um, We the ranger downed the blue potion so he had some hit points back <laughs> the rest of us were pretty beat up so we decided to continue on and there was a juncture where Frank tried to get us to go up a ladder if we wanted to. He was going, hey, there's a safety valve on this. You guys can leave. And he pointed it out more than once just so we were sure. I but we continued on the bit. quest and found, <laughs> found an area of new construction that led underneath the religious district of the city and uh, <clears throat> there were some bats <clears throat> around mm -hmm. there. And then uh, we got into the place by, I used thaumaturgy actually to open an unlocked door, which happened to have a urinal attached to the other side of it, uh, allowing us into the basement bathroom of a crypt that had been set up to run the Cathaway Underground Crab Fighting Club. Hey, 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 don't skimp on the funny detail. Oh, come, what fun? Oh, you mean the, the drunken priest who... Had to sideways wander and piss all over the floor. 
Yes. Well, when the Jay door Paul. opened, the guy was still peeing into the urinal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he sideways scattered to avoid peeing on us, but he covered the floor. But Dave was nice enough to press to digitate that away. Oh, yeah. And also, he was capable of spamming press to digitation and cleaning us up, or we would not have been able to stay at the crab fights at all. Well, at least Baz wouldn't have. <laughs> not in the condition that the sewers left him. Massively yep. disappointing. Um, but therein, we ran into Dwayne the Brick Johnson, who had recovered the ferret, returned it. Yeah, I know. Baz has a super huge crush on him. He's amazing. Um, had managed to uh, return the ferret and had 20 bucks to bet on himself for the crab fight. Uh, but it turns out that our uh, buddy uh, Fluzzy decided he was going to fight the crab. And having been healed up by a potion, uh, decided he could do it. We all cheered him on while we drank and took a little short rest to recover hit points. Uh, I even won money on betting on him. It was and good. Car Carol was uh, ripping people off. Mm -hmm. Well, and he ended yeah, up with one hit point. I almost got him too. Yeah, I had uh, animal friendship and speak with animals. <laughs> I had the beast speech, whatever feet. Um, How that way. <laughs> no, I was gonna. I was holding off on it to see how Fluzzy was doing. It. Otherwise, I was gonna convince the crab to take a dive. <laughs> oh, you think? <laughs> I'm gonna try. Gonna try. <laughs> crabs are notoriously hard headed. You can't <laughs> knock them into. I was gonna say. I think the crabs that take a dive end up on the special dinner plate. <laughs> that, is, that is true. In the UCFC, losers are lunch. <laughs> I, I seem to remember Baz ordering. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. You got to order spotty. Hey, you don't get to sit and watch the crab fights with Dwayne the Brick Johnson every night in Cathaway. That's all I got to say about it. And when you do that get the true. chance, you forget all about Carol stealing from everybody. Yeah. 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 And crab leg dinners for everybody. And that's how rogues do. <laughs> it was it his father, Frank Gorshin, the Riddler? Yes. Because <laughs> wow. there was a big question mark. On a map that they found by Emro. Emro, get it? Mike Rowe. You had to bring Mike Rowe into it. Yep. <laughs> it was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it. We didn't get rewarded. Oh yeah. I didn't I didn't tell them from the beginning that I had plenty of money because I skimped on everything except a really nice set of clothes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Basel has almost no possessions other than money and some really nice clothes. Wow. A few nice. weapons. So watch Saturday on YouTube. It just got uploaded today for some odd reason. I don't know why it took so long. <laughs> Frank is so, a lazy. Oh, actually, no. Saturday got uploaded right away. Yeah, That's right, right away. It's Thursday and Sunday that just got uploaded today. All right, yeah. you called well, me out. I don't Twitch actually anyway. watch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> if you are watching, you are watching. You are watching. You aren't watching. It's not that I don't want to. <clears throat> I just don't feel like it. Anyway, <laughs> so that leads us to the following night, Sunday, with the Franks. And Frank, you're the only Frank here available to talk about the Franks and that beautiful, lovely shit show that they do. <laughs> what happens? Shit, shit show is right in episode 225, Smidge's Roadhouse. Uh, the party last week found themselves at the end of day two in their travel to the ruins, and they took shelter in Smidge's Roadhouse uh, this past Sunday. They were able to investigate it, while two members of the party simply wanted to get a really good night's rest on some exquisite bedding. Uh, the other four ding-dongs decided to hang out in what can best be described as a medieval truck stop. Uh, hilarity ensued when Dalton, uh, whom Middle Frank was calling out the week before, showed up as a female half-orc ranger who put the moves on him, but uh, unfortunately his nephew, a.k.a. Haggis Crapstain, uh, the term is cock-blocked him, or as we now call it, crap stained him uh, and blew his chance uh, having a romantic interlude, which ended up being good for him because her next target was Felix the Rogue. Uh, she laid on the charm thick and he fell forward hook, line, and sinker, only to discover that 
she tied him up and showed him a wanted poster of the entire group from Cragwitch. And she is trying to pick off every single member that she can. Uh, nobody in the party knows where Felix is. He is hogtied. And uh, in the meantime, young Haggis Crapstain trying to put the moves on some sweet, sweet uh, barmaids uh, ended up falling for one of the oldest tricks in the book as the three barmaids tricked him to get naked and pose seductively and then stole his shit, including <laughs> a very expensive bow that he just bought. Uh, needless to say, uh, copious bee bitters and leaf, the last sane druid of the party, are not going to get that good night's sleep in what can best be described as a Hilton Gold Suite. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it is a shit show. It is uploaded, uh, and the audio version will be I don't know, ready in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm still trying to get caught up. That, in a nutshell, was episode 225, Smidge's Roadhouse. Back to you, Kyle. Man. I think I would love to own a roadhouse mm -hmm. as a player. But speaking of owning a roadhouse, nice. oh my gosh, nice what a segue. segue. Yeah. Amazing. Make America <laughs> great again. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> That's just a random white hat or a red hat with white letters. They don't mind. <laughs> it actually says NASCAR. <laughs> wow. Totally different cult. <laughs> I thought it was the cult of the 17 year olds oh sorry Matt Getz <laughs> oh, 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 oh. no one cares yeah. <laughs> so guys we're talking about uh, uh, land ownership I mean we can segue roll this into property ownership because I mean like I said everyone wants to own a roadhouse eventually at some point in the real world but I mean, let's start off this question. Why are we bringing land ownership, taxes, and all of this horrible stuff onto our players? Is that something they really want? I mean, sure, they can sleep with the barmaid and have the barmaid tie them up and everything like that. But why would the party want to go to an orphanage? Sorry, a orphanage. Orphanage. Adopt <laughs> right. all the orphans and bring them to some estate where they can grow alcohol and everything like that. Why would you do that to a bunch of orphans? Uh, and so let's wow. start with Frank. This this sounds familiar, Frank, does it? I think, I think it rings a bell. Uh, also, a Gen Con offering uh, it is published, Adventures in Philbar. It's called Tequila Estates. So mm -hmm. the background of this was uh, the party had killed off a swamp or shadow dragon or some bullshit, some, some BBG, and the town, uh, in lieu of actual gold or treasure, uh, gave them an estate on the cliffside that used to be an old abbey uh, that's been kind of abandoned-ish. Uh, so as fourth or sixth level players, they, they don't have the right to levy taxes. That's something that higher uh, arcing characters have. But I figured... They can own this. They can go ahead and cultivate it, use it as a base of operations, but first they have to clean it out. So as a sandbox adventure, various portions of the estate holdings had a variety of different issues. Uh, and for me, property ownership in that regard allows you, the DM, to go ahead and sandbox the shit out of a stay that could be used as a base of operations. Uh, it, it was a whim when I wrote it uh, and it turned out to be one of my top three favorite scenarios ever um, so if you want to pick it up uh, you do have to pay for it I think it's three bucks but it's called Tequila Estate uh, and it is fun as shit <laughs> it really is uh, but yeah in, uh, in the home version one of the players came up with the idea to empty the orphanage uh, to use them as indentured servants. And it's just like, well, man, <laughs> like, okay. But uh, for me, the property ownership was just a great segue into, I'm throwing you in this sandbox. 
you have a place to stay, you go out, you clear the area, you come back, you stay. Uh, and eventually they did leave the area, but they retained property ownership of this place that uh, had the ability to make ale and wine. So that, that would be my goal uh, in lieu of the higher levels, of course. Sure. Okay. So having some land ownership, <clears throat> filling it full of horrible, awful things, it's a great way to have an adventure. But what do you guys do with the land afterwards? And Frank, I'm going to take this off over to... Mm, I'm not a chaotic character. I don't have a coin on me at all time. So here's a tape measure. <laughs> all right. Rob, what do you guys do after you clear out a adventure filled uh, piece of land? What are the players are doing with it and how are they maintaining interest in this? Why well, I mean, it... you got to look at it like, first of all, it kind of depends on what the piece of land is and what it can be used for. If you've got like the uh, tavern, over the portal to the dungeon kind of situation or warehouse that has a giant fissure opens in the floor and there's underground caverns that need cleared out, whatever you're going for, that's going to make some difference about it. But like uh, in the last campaign that I had, I had a similar situation. The place had been taken over by bandits. The mission that the party reached at that point was to clear out the bandits and return the ownership of the inn and the little fortified compound around the inn along the road to the family that rightfully should have owned it. They took care of that. They set up in there. They got the inn back to going. The, one of the characters, I think they were like seventh-ish, sixth, seventh level at that point in time, wanted to get this business thing going, and it was in a good area for that to happen. So he set up that business opportunity. And then they ended up kind of like um, partnering in with them on the inn, which gave them a base of operations in the area. And then later when they were like, I think, 12th or 13th level, I branched it out and railroaded them by franchising the end. Nice. So for the dungeon master, that piece of property can become later issues that arise. Someone has kidnapped your prized chef. Um, you know, you want to open a branch in Waterdeep. Uh, your ale contract or your, your contract for malt and hops uh, for your ale brewing business is like normally really great but your har it, the harvest has come everything's up and uh, it hasn't arrived why you can use that base of operations as a way to use the, get the characters to do what you want them to to a certain degree or at least offer them those hooks um, but when it comes down to it if they get attached to the end then yeah you can use it to abuse them mightily um <laughs> So this is why land ownership is a great idea in a campaign. It is. <laughs> Come on back. Come on back, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that's great. It's a good thing you guys went out and got all that treasure because the roof needs to be replaced. Sewer's back, though. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. You're muted. Kyle's hey, asking Steve beautiful had. questions. I <laughs> am there. Articulate Scott would be checking himself into AA right now if nice. he heard just how <laughs> wonderful they were. <laughs> David, nice. you were bragging about this story of a, a water deep land ownership. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that since we're telling a few <laughs> stories here. And there. Well, in the home campaign that I'm, that I'm running with some friends, we um, uh, where we've got two different campaigns and they both take place in water deep. Um, the original campaign, I mean, we've, we've used water deep as a base of operations for so long with the wealth that our characters that we've been playing for two years now acquired and stuff like that. We started businesses. I mean, we have estates, we bought villas in, <laughs> in water deep uh, or at least one of us bought a vi villa i ended up buying a building with shops and actually building you know like a manor on top of it so galleria <laughs> pretty much it's called alderwood place <laughs> so because because wow. one of the things that they did they took ownership of a shop uh they looted a grand library and they had all these books 
also these rare items and stuff like that. So my name, my character's name is Alistair. So the store was called Alistair's Books, Bobbles, and Rarities. <laughs> and above the store, we actually built his his abode. So, um, but the thing is, the way that the DM is running it, I mean, we have to pay taxes. The store has employees. We got to pay them. There, there's sales that have to be made and stuff like that. And our DM is wonderful. She accounts for all of that. But we've also accumulated so much wealth and all that that we've become philo- philanthropic and we start re- rescuing almost every street urchin in Waterdeep. The fuck? <laughs> yeah. We started an organization called Friends of Waterdeep. So, yeah. You, say so philanthropic, you mean indentured servitude. That's it. Orphans. <laughs> Orphans. That has got to be a theme with land ownership uh, in D&D because, I mean, my God. That's Even the official did. supplement has it. Even so, the, the Troll Skull Manor or whatever it is. It, it ends up being, you end up rescuing every prostitute, every little, little, you know, crumb snatcher and stuff like that and just putting them to work, you know, so. Not has, to mention has, the goblin it, in the basement. Yeah, has any of them stolen a very important item that you had to hunt them down? Uh, yes, we have. Sure. So we've had that. Uh, All right. You make so it is out of them? Huh? <laughs> Did you make an example out of him? Use him as a human torch to uh, light the way? No. Bloody we bull. haven't done that. We haven't done that. <laughs> Says Jesus saves, everybody else <laughs> takes full damage. <laughs> but I mean, in comparison, when I was like, I wasn't even a DM yet, and I was running, uh, help running uh, a campaign for kids at the comic <laughs> shop, uh, our, our prime DM just uh, had a hellacious work schedule and couldn't come every day so basically what we did is um i filled in for him and what he did is we were playing out of the abyss so we we played the whole thing with meeting brunor and clearing out gonzalgrim the the dwarven undermountain city so we ended up uh the DM just ended up giving everybody land, you know, in this, in, in the, the underdark, uh, to, to just cultivate as their own, turn this dwarven kingdom into theirs. And it was great. You got Landed. to see the kids. I mean, they were, they were, it's gotta be a running theme with, uh, 12 year olds, Frank, because they go for any sexual innuendo whatsoever. In this this kingdom, there was a bordello. In your endo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they, th- these kids, on their own, created a bordello. They created a casino. First thing they did was establish a tavern. <laughs> so, but I bet their parents were thrilled to know it. Oh, yeah, they were thrilled. But, Did you go back to killing people, kids? Yeah, <laughs> which eventually they did. You know, when I said, "Hey, kids, how about let's running an evil campaign?" Yeah, you know. So you aren't yeah. allowed to go by those kids I anymore. Kick a buddy. About... <laughs> Three hundred feet or so, right? <laughs> exactly. But uh, as a DM, it gives you license or whatever to you know kind of foster <laughs> their storylines. Uh, also, you know, I mean you know, exercise your will as a DM saying taxes are due. This is due. Oh no, the city is overrun by such and such. Your property is destroyed, you know? So, I mean, those are the follies with becoming a property owner. So, but, you know, I mean, it's just your, your players love it. I mean, because like, for example, they even put it in one of the campaigns, uh, Dragon Heist, Waterdeep. Uh, There's a whole thing. Uh, called Troll Skull Manor. And you clear out Troll Skull Manor uh, after playing this scenario, and you get the deed to t- uh, t- uh, Troll Skull Manor. And it was a tavern. And you have the choice to get it up and running again and use it as your base of operations. So I'm starting to see that as a theme with Dungeon Masters is to their players. They give it, uh, they give them, land ownership as to use as a base of operations and just kind of offshoot into to everything off of that i find uh land ownership is a good way to spend downtime uh your players i mean you know they can create items they can 
you know, I mean, uh, there's, I think there's a table for revelry and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just with, with skies, uh, with land ownership, the sky's the limit with pretty much the fun you can have with it. So anyway, that's my yeah. take on it. And so what are you talking about? Yeah, a money train. Yeah. Well. It is. It is. It is. A, <laughs> it is a money sink. And players love it. They love to like acquire things because they're all greedy little capitalists. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> but like for example, they got creative too. Like for example, okay, we're <laughs> in the underdark. There's no water source or anything like that. So, okay, one other thing I brought up to him. Okay, what about sewage? This stuff has got to go somewhere. Well, they created a sewer system with black pudding in it that was warded, and that, that's how the, it disposed of all their waste. You know, it's just black pudding. You know? Sounds good. Yeah. Delicious. Yeah. yeah, I didn't come up Roast with the idea of franchising the ends. Out. I just ran with it when the party did. And, the and that was the next- other thing. If I didn't want to do a combat-heavy session, just come up with some small problem that they have to resolve about their place. 60% of the session is them role-playing with each other about how they're going to fix this problem that they're in. Yeah, wards failed on the sewers and the black pudding started rising. So there, there you go. That, there you that, go. That's a caveat right there. So. so it sounds like you can honestly have a whole campaign centered around <coughs> one little piece of land. Mm-hmm. But you guys are all experienced DMs in your own right. David, we're waiting for you with that one shot any day now. Yeah, any day, day now. Day. <laughs> 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 but uh, when do you guys introduce land ownership? What is there a prime level that's really good? Or are you just a, I'm tired of coming up with adventures. You come up with something. Here it is, third level. When do you guys do it? Uh, Frank, I know fourth through sixth level is when we encountered Kilia Estates. Was mm-hmm. that a good level for it? Or would you have rather had it later, earlier? I think it worked out real well because it did serve as a base of operations and it did have Jesus at what, like 20 different nested scenarios in there. Uh, so it gave the party enough time to recover, but there was always something going on. I mean that, so yes, you're going to get a rest, but Jesus Christ, when the bullet comes crashing through shit gets broken, you got to fix that. Then a or damn the dragon Brad starts going through the servant quarters. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, there, there's just, uh, or, or you meet the caretaker <laughs> and repeatedly <laughs> threaten to kill him. And it's like, Jesus. Uh, so, but yeah, I liked fourth through sixth because that allowed me the opportunity because the group has gone the width and breadth of the entire continent. And here they are on the coast. What can they do? Well, shit always happens on the coast because you never know what washes up uh so you can have sky pirates water pirates uh flying shit i mean anything so i think fourth through sixth noting that they don't get any revenue from this so especially if a dm has oh shit i gave him too much money hey that roof needs fixed Mm -hmm. and the contractor's a dick (laughs) (laughs) Steve, Same the contractor, is a dick. Yeah. Well, now I I only give titles at ninth level, like the old school. So at, when when you get the lord or lady or viscount, whatever, then you can get taxes. So then you can start to recoup some of your losses. But then you have responsibilities added on top. Correct. Uh, so yeah, any, anywhere from I, I would say probably fifth on. Fourth is a little early, unless it's in a city like Cacophony. If you want to own that bungalow, I, I never really screwed with you guys with that piece of property. So, no. Nope. Nope. Uh, we we're so always you- too busy, Frank. <laughs> the next adventure was right around hey, the next day. The company is always moving. Mm-hmm. Oh, so, yeah, yeah I, I would say four through six worked out well for me. Okay. Uh, David, where are you at with the whole land ownership, building ownership, <laughs> property? When do you give it to them? Uh, I start early three level three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Cause, uh, it gives you time. It gives you time as a DM to figure out what the hell you're going to do next. You know, <laughs> so, you know, let them sandbox in the city, you know, and, you know, until you can get together your campaign and go or long adventure and get them on that, 
you know, because that's what I'm doing right now with Lost Minds of Fandelver and all that. Really, you're supposed to start right away, like right out of uh, um, Neverwinter, but you know, the characters when they started, they met in Water Waterdeep, so it ended up uh, taking. They had to they one of the things that they did is they started in Waterdeep and I had them as their job, escort a caravan to uh, Neverwinter. And that was a 10 day trick with, with like encounters and stuff like that all in between. So having a base of operations gave me time to kind of think and put things together as a DM. So, you know, and it, it made it fun for them too, because I mean, God, your players love downtime for some reason. <laughs> so. All right. I, I think it gives a sense of realism in, a, in an otherwise fantasy, fantastical world. I mean, it's nice to have responsibilities that, you know, okay, well, I can accomplish something tangible. I can make sure that the roof is fixed. And it's like, or you can kill about 500 fucking kobolds, <laughs> you know, and take all their shit. True, but if I don't fix the roof in your imaginary world, mm -hmm. it's still a broken roof next week. Meanwhile, I have a dead plant or a dead hamster or a dead wife at the bottom of a well if I forget those responsibilities. <laughs> right. I mean, what? <laughs> what? Huh? <laughs> Rob, where are you lying on this whole? When do you give them some land and property? And well, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of in that same zone. Uh, like mm -hmm. when I gave them the hook toward the acquiring the end, it wasn't really acquiring the end. It was the adventure of like these people that own this end. It's been taken by these guys, and by the time they cleared out the bandit dudes, and then the subsequent supernatural problem in the basement, um, they were you know, uh, I think they were third level when they started it all. And by the time they were entering into partnership with the inn owners, they were fifth level. And then they had a base of operations for all those better, like two tier tier two adventures where you're going up against some tougher monsters and you're going to need to come home and lick your wounds somewhere. And it's really nice when you come home and you don't have to like pony up the cash for you, the meals you're going to have in the tavern. Cause your staff yeah. and family partnered in. Until and then they came up with the idea of franchising. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. Then they came up with the idea of that, that they wanted to like maybe come up with this franchise idea. So I let it mull for a little while. And then I built a franchise opportunity scenario that sent them off to end up fighting something far more powerful than they thought they were going to have to, to acquire that next piece of property. A little bit more detail into that. What level were they and what were they fighting at that point? for another inn that they could franchise well yeah the the other one was on a what was on a coastal zone so there was a uh, potential to have it was an inn with a warehouse and waterfront connection so uh there was the adventure with the inn led to the fact that it was the pirates that were doing the problem and it led to them having to go to the pirate island and do that so um that was around i think that was seventh level when they did that and that adventure cycle took them to eighth level okay of acquiring that in and defeating the pirate chieftain and and then they wanted to start a shipping business so that threw in all kinds of other things that Darwin. a lot of thinking on that one jeez <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, yeah. it's, it's really hard to like when once you get characters who are in a mercantile mindset um, sometimes it's hard to get them not to try everything they want to try. Mm -hmm. But I just made shit cost money. They're like doing these shipping contracts, but not uh, not understanding the cost of refitting their ships because none of them had any experience. So I just let the bills for refitting the ship build up until they couldn't send anything. And then they had to go out and find more money. Gee, isn't that terrible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Shipping company, did they have any experiences sailing or all that? Or they not had a, to, one of them. They, they had, had to hire, hire a crew. <laughs> and exactly. then they hired a crook. And, and if it then... were my players, they would have sunk the ship right off the top. <laughs> they, or, they... or Ian would have crashed it. <laughs> <laughs> in their first in their foray against the pirates uh, and the pirate chief, they actually sunk the ship that they took to get to the pirates on the way there. And they had they took a raft to the pirate island and ended up having to fight their way through that situation and 
obtain a pirate vessel and some willing pirates at sword point to get them back oh they must yeah they must look cool as shit coming in on a raft (laughs) (laughs) it was a whole series of skill challenges and survival checks to make sure that they could keep gear and themselves alive getting out of that sinking ship it's always a fun thing to do ate like a four and a half hour session just beautiful they were all thrilled i didn't have to do any work at all and the yep. Markoth shows up detecting all their magical weapons and shows up to take them away. <laughs> no, they didn't have that problem. <laughs> Captain, we're being attacked. Where's the Armada at? No, it's just that rowboat right out there. <laughs> exactly. It's like Johnny Depp coming into port. Just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a little more like that. It was the four of them on a raft arriving. and But you have heard of them. <laughs> and they lied about who they were and what they were doing there and that's how they made their way in some really nice rolls on persuasion and uh <clears throat> deception checks nice all right and given a property whew, that eases any dm's problems almost instantaneously mm-hmm. so you gave them the property fifth level about I already got the answer from Rob. He decided to franchise as the players (laughs) got more. How does the land evolve? Uh, Frank, you were saying they get to collect taxes at ninth level. Where does it go on after that, David? You know, you didn't even mention Jack Diddley about what happens at your place, but uh, (laughs) what's happening to this property as the, the players level up? Well, like like I said, I mean, you know, said property is a store, so, you know, you have to acquire goods to go into the store. You have mm-hmm. taxes you have to pay, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, you see, you have accountants you have to pay for, and yeah. And you sometimes know, murder. Yeah. That, Accidentally kill them. Kill them. Exactly. I, that's what I meant. Because courts are an entirely different thing. <laughs> You get oh, a demand for uh, a bigger variety of books, and you have to open up an extra dimensional space in the store mm-hmm. behind a curtain that says XXX. Yes, there you go. Saloon <laughs> doors. Saloon <laughs> doors. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. No. My no. literatica over here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, uh, sir, we don't let children back here. <laughs> Wendy, <I'm... laughs> Wendy does water deep. Oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah, so you have that, you know. So And if you start getting multiple interests, like, say, oh, I want to open a tavern in Waterdeep. Well, great. Guess what? You got to pay taxes on that, too. <laughs> Not only that, you're going to have to bribe a masked lord to get a permit, pay off the guilds. I mean... Mm-hmm. You want to buy a t- you want a tavern in Waterdeep? You're looking at a lot of bureaucracy, lo- gotta, legal and illegal. Yep, you have to you have to know the I guilds. Would assume that you know, yeah. Cathaway yeah. would probably present a similar issue. Yeah. Now, now the thing about it though, with Rob's Inn franchise, if it's just a roadside inn out in the middle of nowhere, or if it's Tequila Estates, welcome to Frankopolis. Because now you get other people. It's like, hey, I need a smith. I need a lumber mill. Da da da. da. All Uh of a sudden, you know, you've got streets and shit. You you end up building a burg or a hamlet, a little fortified town. It ends up becoming civilization, the video game. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Basically, that's what it is. I mean, that's how you you keep the chieftains from taking over your inn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Surrounded with the city. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, to do all that, you need resources. Okay, I need miners. Go out and, you know. Well, it's like original Warcraft. Hey, mm-hmm. lumber, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, the miners, the, the, the timber men won't work because these freaking wood goblins keep coming out and, like, attacking them and stealing their shit. Mm-hmm. So they won't work. So you got to go take care of them goblins before these guys can get your lumber for you. Exactly. Dun, 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 dun. The, the stonemasons uncover a, a demonic crypt. And they've mm-hmm. unleashed evil. You gotta, you gotta take care of that shit. No marble for you. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> All of your skilled craftsmen disappear because they're being taken by slavers and sold overseas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Somebody else read your one ads and is waiting to pick off your workers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, it, it's things like that. I mean, like I said, I mean, paying taxes <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things being a property owner, you become, uh, and if you were one of the things that we're playing, if you're a high, high level magic user, you have to serve one day a month in like the magical equivalent of the magical, you know, uh, guard working for the magisterium. So you got to do that. You got to go out on patrol and stuff like that. Adventures, you know, adventures can come out of that. So, and And you you always have adventures coming into your shop, fucking around thinking that you're some puny shopkeep. It's like, oh, I'm gonna, gonna have to fireball your ass, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, own this bar. Oh man, I I never forget. We were uh, me, our characters were out. We were doing patrol in one of the districts in Waterdeep, and we we come on to out of uh, we go into a tavern. Uh, <coughs> we you know check everything out there. We come out. <laughs> And there's this bard, he's just playing and, you know, there are people just in rapture, just putting money in and all that. And it just kind of seems like the, there was like this floating pattern above him and stuff <laughs> like that. So he was using hypnotic, pa- calling people in, charming, hypnotic pattern and stealing from them. So we had to arrest him. So when we arrested him, we, d- we found out that this bard has a name and the na- name he went under was Sir Smooth. So we followed that up with arresting him. Then, you know, the next adventure, we had his time in court. And then we find out what his real name was, Mel- Melvin Picklewood. So there you go. <laughs> so all kinds of hilarity can come out of this, man. So, yeah. I mean, land ownership can lead to a lot of great things. So. Who's the guy out of Star Trek? Not the one that sold Tribbles, but the other one. Uh, Hardcore Fenton. Fenton. Mud. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, mud. mud. Harvey Mud. Yeah, yep. Har- hardcore Fenton Mud. That's what That's his it. name was. Yep. Yep. What a dick. <laughs> Guess who you guys are seeing Saturday? Guess who? <laughs> oh, you brought up the Star Trek episode. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have the equivalent of troubles to deal with. Want to buy a wife or three? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. All right, two, guys, two wives are allowed in the army, but one's too many for me. He's about to end it. I'm trying to end it, goddammit, but you people. I, I'm, getting the, I'm getting the head shaking at the buying three wives. They were robots. Oh, Doppelganger yeah. robots. There you go. Saturday, <laughs> folks. Watch the calamity offshoot. Doppelganger <laughs> wives. <laughs> like Stepford wives, it'll kill you. All right, real quick. 5e it is not really pumped up with a lot of information wstc not coming out with a lot of stuff you guys have been gaming for quite a while or you gamed really early on and then came back into it is there older material that is useful for newer dms of 5e oh yeah who have absolutely no idea because obviously we probably don't want to go into the full span of real world in your D&D for that. So what materials, what's top material you think for how to set up some sort of stronghold? Let's start. Frank got interested in this question. He's leaning forward, so I'm going to give it to Rob instead. <laughs> <laughs> um I don't have like a list or uh, any way of providing one. I just I, I recall that we had the the whole thing about AD when AD and D came out with your hardback dungeon master's guide, it was the first real instance of talking about anything other than a line type mention of strongholds and followers and such like that. Um, the original AD and D dungeon master's guide gave you some basics, and you just go crazy from there. Um, that's about where I'd go with it, as far as old okay. school resources. Um, I guess like that. Matt Colville guy has got a whole bloody strongholds and followers Kickstarter project out there. If you want to look at something and he's got about 25 videos on YouTube about it. So all right, uh, poke your head there. If you need some material, <laughs> Frank, hit me up on Twitter. I'll people. shoot shit at you all day long. <laughs> uh, or show up to a Tuesday show. <laughs> the, the best. And, and I will not stress this enough. 
the best guide that you can use uh, from 2E, they used to be called the Blue Books. Uh, and these were 150 to 200 page supplements on a variety of topics. Uh, the Green Books were all about civilizations like Rome or the Celts and all this, but the Blue Books offered a look at just a variety of topics. Creative campaigning is one of them. I mean, that is a must have. Uh, that thing has everything, creative campaigning. Uh, there's also something called the Campaign Source Book and Catacomb Guide. Highly recommend that. And the third one is, uh, oh, I can't find it. Uh, the World Builders Guidebook. Uh, those three titles, uh, the blue books, <laughs> uh, trust me, uh, you, I think you can still get it on drive through RPG uh, in PDF form. They might be available in print, but uh, holy shit, uh, read those on the toilet and everybody <laughs> will yell at you because you will sit in there until you read it all. Those, those books, uh, and I, I wish I knew who the authors were. I could pull it up, but uh, the folks that did those books just knocked it out of the park. Ideas out the ass. There's even a book on villains uh, to tailor make your villains to your level. The blue books are, are a, a, a highly prized asset. If you don't have one, get one. They're, they're Show gorgeous. up next Tuesday. We're going to do nothing but talk about the blue books, guys. That's All it. right. David, do you have a resource that you uh, newer DMs could use for specifically land and that kind of stuff? It's uh, mentioned in those. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> the thing is, is that my experience has only been from box edition to uh, 5e, like mm -hmm. then and then start again in 5e. And I really didn't know of any resources back then for world building and land ownership. I mean, mm -hmm. Because I was a kid playing, and we, we, you know, it was hard to find a DM. So I mean, we couldn't really get into it. So, but it wasn't until I walked into a game store and presented with Five E, I was just like, "What the hell?" And then the Dungeon Master's Guide had it all, you know, for pretty much. I mean, from what I saw. So that's right, guys. Read your books, and maybe you'll also get useful information. <laughs> No. Some of us recommend it. Some of us don't. <laughs> All right, guys, that is the end of the show. Uh, real quick, follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter. You could check out our YouTube <laughs> archive or go over to tinyurl.com slash audio if you don't want to look at our faces. We got to thank Oddfish Game and their smelly adventure sense. They are great. Don't smort them. If you want to buy our stuff, we got cool stuff like cozy dice, pirate dog dice. Oh my gosh, you're just oh, shoving Jesus. everything in the cameras and I'm trying to mention it. All out of order. No, don't do that, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all right. I've got Blooming Prairie, not Putrid Sewer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If you want to see these three guys, they are playing on saturday the calamity campaign it mm -hmm. is a one-off of the calamity world what hijinks craziness will they get into next episode of murder hobo though is the cred campaign on thursday the players have just escaped a terrible awful town of fish people and they're now safe on the water so what could happen? <laughs> <laughs> that is Rob. That is Frank. That is David. I am Kyle. We are going to cut out. Everybody wave. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Bye.